Hi, everybody. Um, so this is going to be our first uh, video lecture of uh, the semester. Um, and so you'll see a lot of these over the course of the semester. So the idea of them is just to basically um, watch them and then that'll sort of give you the direction to go with for uh, discussion questions. And then we'll sort of bring it back <clears throat> when we get to the actual official uh, meeting on Thursday. Uh, but today is a pretty casual one. Um, in terms of our course, this is a pretty casual day. What I want to do is give some context for the Greek gods. Some of you may be very, very familiar with the Greek and Roman gods, some of you may not. So if this is more familiar to you, you know, then you, uh, you know, don't have to worry about it quite so much. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe this is your first time learning about the Greek gods. And I wanted to make sure in a mythology class, we spend at least a little time talking about that context. Um, what I also want to do is give some context for gods and religion in general. Like, you know, when we're talking about mythology, it's very easy to lose sight of the fact that for many people, this is and has been their religion. Um, so what does that religion actually look like? What is the human relationship with the gods? I want to say a little bit more about that. And I also want to talk about the stories that you read. Um, the book of the Iliad and the um, summary of the Greek mythology stories. So, you know, that's a fair few things. Um, this is not coming from the textbook so much, but this is kind of more of a lighter, uh, fun day. So, uh, yeah, let's see how it goes. So what I want to start off with is talking about the Greek gods in general. So I want to take us over to the D2L site real quick. Okay, so we've loaded in the uh, course... Um, days here, the content page. So you've seen the, probably this by now, or maybe not, have seen the um, content page for today and the title Greek and Roman God. So I had you read the Iliad uh, chapter and uh, the Greek mythology story summary. Um, and then I also have this resource here, which I call the Greek and Roman Gods cheat sheet. And now I'm going to switch over to that. So this is basically just to give you a foundation, um, and this will actually help for the next reading when you're looking at um, uh, the Greek creation myth, which is where we're going to focus our attention initially um, when we talk about creation myths. Um, this is a sheet that will tell you the Greek name of the god, the Roman name of the god, and, you know, in a few words, what they are the god of. Um, now, this the god of idea is a very quintessentially Greek kind of thing. That's one of the things that um, maybe influences our perspective a little bit. Not always in a mythology does a god have to be the god of something, but the Greeks in particular liked the idea of gods having a very sort of singular concept. Um, and then they also had the habit where they could just turn a word into a god. So we say, okay, justice. Okay, well, uh, justice is a goddess, and she's a goddess who's all about justice. Uh, things like that. So that kind of influences the thinking here, and it can sometimes be a bit of a chicken and egg scenario, like did we start with the concept or did we start with the god? Um, but some of these gods go very far back, too. Um, so uh, the other interesting and weird thing about the Greek mythology is that it is very closely paralleled by Roman mythology, because what seems to be is that the Romans were pretty big uh, fanboys of the Greeks in a lot of ways. Um, they discovered Greek culture, and they took the parts they liked, at least. Some parts they liked, some parts they didn't like, but they became a little obsessive over the parts that they liked. And so they took the names of their gods, um, which were, you know, had names like things like Jove and Neptune and things like that, and they tried to find correspondences uh, with the Greek gods. And that, uh, that's systematizing, finding correspondence with other people's uh, gods is something I want to talk about in a little bit too. Um, so I'm just going to sort of give a little real quick go through of these different gods. And then maybe this process might be helpful, you know, just a quick, quick statement on each of them. And maybe this process might be helpful for when you guys are doing your own research into a god. Maybe this will help you find one that you want to learn more about. So of course, uh, we start off with Zeus. Um, he is pretty famous, possibly the most famous Greek god, and that makes sense because he's the leader of the pantheon. Um, he's very associated with being a king. Um, he is, you know, the king of the gods. Um, his main thing is the lightning bolt, lightning and thunder. He throws lightning bolts. But he's also really strongly associated with power and laws. If you're a lawbreaker, Zeus is going to be the one who will punish you. In Rome, he's known as Jove or sometimes Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is probably more common. Then we've got Hera, Zeus's wife. 
Um, and um, I say that not to reduce her to that role, but that marriage is a big part of her role. She's strongly associated with marriage and power in similar ways to the way Zeus is. Um, she is, let's see, which makes it kind of interesting actually, because her marriage is really bad. Um, she is constantly getting into arguments with Zeus um, because mainly because he's off sleeping with other women and she, he has children and she tries to destroy them. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic and it sort of shows the Greek relationship to the gods is more, you may have heard the term soap opera. I think that's uh, appropriate, that it's sort of tempestuous and the gods act very much like real people. These are gods who are not supposed to be super dignified or whatnot. Some other traditions may be the gods are not quite so um, full of comical shenanigans. But I mean, maybe it just depends on the god. Um, in Hera, it's all about that sort of almost like a sitcom dynamic. Um, and it shows a kind of negativity towards women and towards marriage um, in ancient Greece. Um, but, you know, I like Hera. I think she, you know, there's some other myths where she's kind of more respected in her own right that are kind of lost to us today, we think. Um, so, you know, it seems like her story was kind of taken over by Zeus a little bit. We've got Demeter. We talked about her a lot. Nature goddess, goddess who grows you food. Oh, her um, Roman name is Ceres, like cereal. Uh, Hera's Roman name is Juno. And Demeter is associated with nature and particularly growing plants. Uh, Poseidon uh, is the god of the sea, but he's also got some other stuff going on. He's got earthquakes and horses. So that's pretty interesting. Earthquakes are a big deal in Greece. And I guess the idea with horses is that they're kind of wild like the sea is. So Poseidon has this inherent wildness to him. In Rome, he's known as Neptune. Uh, then we've got Athena. Athena is traditionally the goddess of wisdom. I think it might even be more accurate to call her a goddess of strategy. Um, because she wears a battle helmet and she is very good at helping people do military tactics. Um, she is sort of the patron goddess of Odysseus, who is sort of the most clever man in Greek mythology. Uh, so that makes sense. She's all about uh, teaching people to be clever. Um, and uh, she has that sort of battle status to her. But she is also a young girl. She is one of the three uh, goddesses, and we'll have uh, reasons to talk more about her too, but she is one of three goddesses who are virgin goddesses, which, you know, in Rome, it's more that they have to n not have sex, that they have to be maidens. In, um, in Greece, it's more of an emphasis on the fact that they're young, right? They haven't been married yet. So these are basically teenage goddesses. Um, and so that sort of informs their character, and Athena is one of them. She is not a sexual being, and um, and in Rome, you do not want to violate um, the uh, chastity of Minerva, and she is depicted as very young. Then we've got Hermes. Hermes has an interesting bundle of things. He's all about uh, travel. He can go anywhere. Uh, sometimes people say, use the term liminal spaces, which basically means, you know, he can just um, cross into any sort of other place. He can go to the underworld. Sometimes he brings souls to the underworld. He brings Persephone back out again. So you see him a lot on roads. And in fact, there are these very important Hermes statues at roads, uh, crossroads especially. So he's also the messenger of the gods. He's zipping around in the sky. Um, his Roman name is Mercury and they named the planet Mercury after him because it's very close to the sun. So it really has to zip around in the sky very fast. Um, but interestingly, Hermes is also a tricky guy. He is associated with thieves, and one of his earliest stories is about uh, stealing his brother's sheep, um, Apollo's sheep. So that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, he, he, the, that there is a god of thieves is kind of interesting in itself. Then you've got Aphrodite. Uh, she is not virginal. She is all about the sexuality. I mean, you can call her the god of love, but, uh, you know, what we're really getting at is that she is a god of sexuality. Um, so the relationship to her is very different. You know, people would pray to her if they wanted to have a successful, you know, intimate relationship, uh, not for other reasons. Um, and she is said to have the power to make anybody fall in love. Um, so she makes Zeus fall in love, but Zeus is the only person who can make her fall in love, which is kind of interesting. Um, she has these stories um, where she falls in love with Ares, and Ares is the god of war. Um, now, the Greeks didn't like him very much. Uh, you don't necessarily have to like a god. That's one thing about uh, the way ancient peoples worship gods. Um, sometimes you're just praying to get this god off your back. The god needs to be respected or he's going to kill you. That's kind of the attitude that the Greeks had towards Ares. In contrast, the Romans really loved Mars, the Roman version of Ares, that he was, you know, 
rah, rah, rah into battle because they had just more of an inherent love for battle, uh, which in Greece is more, um, you know, seen as a terrifying thing, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, and then you've got Hestia. Uh, Hestia is the goddess of the home and the hearth. And if we think about that, is we, if we think about that, um, the idea there is kind of that she is associated with uh, women's d life in the home. And, you know, in Greece, a lot of the time, especially among the upper classes, more of the upper classes than the lower classes, women were not supposed to be outdoors as much. And so Hestia is a very important goddess for them. It's interesting that um, that's sort of a married life thing when her, she's another one of those teenage goddesses. I think there's a sense in which, um, you know, maybe young women are kind of being trained for that already. They're learning to do things like weave uh, clothes, which is like the number one thing for women to do in ancient Greek society, um, and cook and uh, clean and things like that, that are thought of as sort of domestic tasks. Um, in Rome, she is known as Vesta, and there's a very important cult to her, um, the Vestal Virgins, these women who uh, pledge to be virgins all their lives long um, and stay in this special temple. Um, and um, yeah, it's a, they perform this very important duty for the city of Rome and keep the sacred flame lit. Um, now you might think that was sort of restrictive on them, but I could actually see it being advantageous because they don't have to get married. They don't have to be controlled by men necessarily. They basically just have their own sort of uh, monastery or nunnery maybe. I mean, it feels more like monks than nuns though. Um, then you have Artemis. She is our last uh, sort of um, teenage goddess. Um, she is not going to get married because she is too busy uh, hunting. She is the hunter. She is associated with wild creatures. She's associated with wild animals. Uh, you know, she'll send a lion after you or turn you into a deer if you try and um, spy on her inappropriately. That's a one story about her. Um, she's also associated with the moon. And what we think what happened here is that the gods kind of, the um, Greeks kind of fused some gods together. They took one moon goddess called Selene, which is just the Greek word for moon, and they fused her with Artemis. So um, those ideas has kind of got merged together. Um, and yeah, uh, it seems like this sort of being a wild hunter is sort of a teenage girl thing in um, uh, ancient Greece. Um, young girls are sometimes described as wild animals. So it's sort of like that's the time in one's life um, where girls are allowed to have this wildness to them. And so Artemis is perpetually a girl, because, a younger, younger girl, because she is not uh, going to be married. She is part of that life. Um, and in uh, Rome, she's known as Diana. In, uh, and we have a similar thing going on with her twin, Apollo. So these gods were born together, they're twins. Uh, Apollo was fused with the sun, uh, Helios slash Hyperion. And he has a lot of sun imagery associated with him. But he also has this sort of rationality to him. He, he's very good at um, like figuring things out and being smart and being clever um, and being sort of serious. Now, at the same time, he's associated with music. He plays musical instruments. And that kind of shows the ways that the Greeks thought about uh, music, uh, that um, you know, it involves sort of figuring out these mathematical relationships between notes. Um, that's kind of interesting. And uh, that sort of sunlight light thing going on, like he has this reasonable way about him. He's going to shed some light on the situation. Now, he also has a bit of an adolescent thing going on. He is sometimes depicted, not always, but sometimes depicted as a young man or like a teenage boy. And so the rituals of coming of age for Artemis are for teenage girls, and then the rituals of coming of age for uh, Apollo are for the teenage boys. Then you've got Hephaestus, um, who is the god of the forge. He is disliked by the other gods, at least in some of the stories that we have. Um, he is said to be ugly and he has a bad leg, so he can't walk properly. Um, so this is a reason that the gods look down on him. They're not very kind. And in fact, you know, oftentimes people in Greece were not very kind to people uh, with disabilities. Um, but he works the forge. Um, he makes things. He's a blacksmith. Um, and he's associated with sort of that kind of crafting. Whereas Athena is associated more with like women's crafting and weaving. And then Hephaestus is, you know, metalwork and stuff like that. Um, and uh, there's also sort of something going on here where it seems like um, people kind of look down on blacksmiths, which is a shame um, because they did a lot of very important work and, you know, getting people armor and stuff like that. And I think that may be an upper class bias being reflected in the stories that we have. 
um, because the upper class are writing things down, um, they kind of thought it was a shame if you had to be a laborer, like a blacksmith. Um, and then Hephaestus was married to Aphrodite, but the story was that she didn't actually love him. And that was tragic. Um, in Rome, he was known as Vulcan, and his name is actually connected to Volcano. Then we have Dionysus, also known as Bacchus. He's particularly known as Bacchus in Rome, but he's also known as Bacchus back in Greece too. And he is the god of, well, traditionally people say he's the god of wine, but what he really is, is the god of madness. He's the god of any kind of altered mental state. He has associations with, associations with blood and guts and things like semen and th stuff like that. He's a pretty wild god. And so the idea with him, I think, is that when you get drunk, you are sort of taken out of your mind. And that's what the sort of spell that Dionysus can put you under. Um, now, there's a lot of evidence that people loved him, too. Like, he, there are, like, no less than four different festivals in Athens that all have to do with Dionysus and, you know, people getting drunk. But there's this sense that he is the god who's around when things are kind of out of control. And there's some stories about him doing that sort of taking people and making them go out of control if they pissed him off. Um, so that's kind of interesting too. You got to respect the god of wine. Uh, sometimes people contrast Apollo and Dionysus. They had, they were both gods associated with music and celebration, but Dionysus was more party time and Apollo was like, let's play some pretty songs. Okay, so all of those gods are what's known as the Olympians. Traditionally, there are 12 Olympians. It's debated on who uh, fits into uh, the last slot, but um, I'm going with Hestia for this list. Um, and these are the gods that live up on Mount Olympus. And so there was a tradition of worshiping 12 gods as sort of the group that exists on Mount Olympus. But there were also a lot of other gods as well. Um, one big one who never went to Mount Olympus was Hades. Um, the Greeks sometimes also called him Ides or Idoneus. Um, we're just more familiar with the name Hades. Um, he is the god of the underworld, the land of the dead. He's not evil like you see in the Disney movie. Although that is a very fun portrayal of him, uh, very smart alecky. Um, he is more just sort of grim. He's not, people don't really necessarily like him, um, but it's hard to say if they don't necessarily think he's evil either. It's just that if the God of the afterlife is watching you, that's probably a bad sign. So you kind of pray to him to like not have you die. <clears throat> Um, now, he's also associated with gold and silver and gems and things like that, because the underworld is said to be under the earth. And so there's this idea that that's where all the, the beautiful treasures come from. So uh, he's sitting on a bunch of treasure. And that's why he's also known as Pluto, um, which means wealth. And in Rome, he is particularly known as Pluto. Uh, then we have Heracles. Heracles is the son of Zeus, but he's one so popular that many stories say he eventually became a god. Sometimes he's the 12th slot on Mount Olympus. He's a warrior hero who did a lot of uh, great tasks. He, you know, he fought monsters. He uh, solved problems cleverly. He even stole uh, Cerberus, the three-headed dog from the afterlife, um, and brought it back. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean he was a nice person. He, some stories depict him as kind of brutal. Um, and yeah, he has this weird connection to Hera too. She was constantly trying to punish him, but Hera is in his name. His name means glory of Hera, Heracles. Um, so that's kind of weird and interesting that fighting her is his claim to glory, something like that. Uh, Hecate is one you might hear about. She's interesting. She is uh, basically the goddess of witchcraft and we don't know as much as we'd like about her. She's sort of got this darkness to her. Um, and a lot of these gods have this darkness to them. Um, and she's associated with magic. Uh, sometimes she's also associated with roads. Sometimes she's said to have three faces. So some think that her Roman equivalent is the goddess Trivia, who is sort of the god of crossroads, goddess of crossroads and magic. Um, and so some people have drawn the connection there, but it's actually a little bit debated. Then we have uh, Persephone. Uh, she is, you know, we talked a lot about her as well. Um, she is associated with a lot of the same things as Demeter, but more in the sense of like new growth and sort of the fragile new fertility of spring. Um, in Rome, she is known as Prosper, Proserpina. Uh, then we have Kronos, um, who we're going to meet in uh, the uh, Theogony um, by Hesiod uh, next time. And Kronos is Zeus's father, and he is um in rome known as saturn but in rome he's a little bit different because in rome uh they have this a mental association of him with agriculture 
um, would, and sometimes say that he presided over a golden age of good crops, which is kind of interesting. Um, his name doesn't actually mean time. That would be Kronos with a CH, but a lot of Greeks did notice the similarity. So there's a little bit of the blurring of the lines there sometimes. Then we've got Uranus in, uh, in Rome known as Uranus, um, who is the god of the sky. He's also going to appear in the Theogony and he's Kronos's father. Uh, and then we've got Prometheus, um, who's again going to be come up in that story. So I won't say too much about him, uh, but he stole fire from the gods. Uh, we've got uh, the Fates. In Greece, uh, that's the Latin Roman name. In Greece, they're known as the Moirai, which basically means about the same thing. Um, they are three goddesses who decide, you know, how long human lifespans will be. And so they determine um, human fate. Um, and a lot of times that fate could be interpreted as doom. They know your doom is coming. A similar group of three are the Furies. Um, who uh, just punish people if they kill their family members. Um, and they come up in a number of Greek stories. Then you've got uh, Gaia slash Gay. We're going to meet her as well. Um, in Rome, she is known as Terra, and she is the ancient god associated with uh, the earth. Uh, we've got Asclepius. Asclepius is um, the god of healing. He's a son of Apollo, who is also associated with healing. And the stories go that he was a doctor who, you know, learned how to be such a good doctor that he was evil, even able to bring people back from the dead. And so Zeus killed him for it uh, because he didn't want people bringing people back from the dead. Um, then you've got Iris. Uh, sometimes she's a messenger of the gods like Hermes is. She is the rainbow. Um, she's associated with the rainbow. And usually when she brings a message, it's from Zeus. So sometimes she seems almost like his handmaiden. Uh, you've also got the son of Aphrodite called Eros, which just means love it's, or sexuality. It's a, the word we get erotic from. In Rome, uh, he's known as Cupid. Um, so you might imagine a little baby, a little, little winged baby, but um, you could also imagine a very handsome young man. Um, Pan is the god of the forest, um, and he can make you panic uh, when you're lost in the forest, and he's sometimes depicted as half goat. In Rome, there's a loose uh, affiliation with a god called Faunus, which is maybe the same thing. You've got Eris, the goddess of strife, uh, basically meaning conflict between people. She often appears to cause trouble. In fact, she appears uh, in the story of the Trojan War. Uh, she is uh, in Rome known as Discordia. Uh, you've got Nemesis, who has the same name in both. Uh, she is the god of retribution, goddess that you pray to, uh, to get revenge, you know, bring suffering to your enemies. You've got the muses um, in both uh, Greece and Rome. They're the goddesses of creativity. Uh, so they inspire you. They put a vision in your head um, to, and allow you to make art. Then finally, a couple more. We've got Nike, the goddess of victory, uh, who in Rome is known as Victoria. And um, a lot of times people just blur the line between her and Athena, or they say she's like an assistant of Athena, because Athena helps you win the battle, and then you're like, oh, hey, victory. And the news of victory has wings. Uh, victory has wings so that she can travel and spread the news of the victory. And then finally, you've got Tyche, who is the goddess of fortune. And in Rome, she's known as Fortuna. And Fortuna is sort of basically the goddess of luck. Um, and we should think in the ancient world of luck as uh, very similar to happiness. Uh, they're basically the same thing. So you pray to this goddess um, to give you good luck so that you will be happy and be successful in your endeavors. As time goes on and things get more chaotic in the world, um, praying to lady luck becomes more and more important. Okay, so that's just a quick little rundown. And hopefully this, you know, sparks some ideas or some questions. So maybe you want to research one of these gods more specifically. In the next video, I'm going to talk more about what it is sort of like to be a worshiper of the gods. So I'll see you in that one.